It's one of the most sensational cases in recent public memory, filled with murder, forbidden sex, and betrayal. It even inspired the hit movie To Die For, starring Nicole Kidman. At its center, a woman doomed to spend the rest of her life behind bars without the possibility of parole for masterminding the murder of her young husband at the hands of a 16-year-old lover. There were more people from the media in the courtroom than there were citizens from the state of New Hampshire. It's all tabloid juice. Even though I didn't give them the gun, I feel like I put the bullets in there sometime by having this relationship. Does that make me responsible for his death in my mind? Yeah, a lot. Am I legally culpable? No. For a quarter century, Pamela Smart has steadfastly maintained her innocence, exhausting all appeals and insisting that she's a scapegoat for the real killers who now walk free. Pamela is not alone. There are growing numbers who now believe her sentence was a shocking miscarriage of justice and are actively seeking her release. That's an odd sentence for her to get life in prison when she wasn't even there. Why would you give a pardon to someone who still denies she had any responsibility in the death of her husband? Pam Smart will never say that she participated in this murder because she didn't. Was an innocent woman framed for her husband's murder? This entire process was mismanaged. It was an unfair trial with an unfair result. Or is Pamela Smart the unrepentant, conniving sociopath that the prosecution and the media have made her out to be? Why did you do that? What were you thinking? There are compelling arguments on both sides. We did what we had to do. It's the appropriate verdict. The whole Pam Smart case is one big, tragic fairy tale. I'm Steve Helling, senior crime reporter for People Magazine. For the next hour, I speak face to face with Pamela Smart from Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in Westchester County, New York. There are no restrictions and absolutely nothing is off limits. I confront Pamela Smart with the evidence against her and get surprisingly candid and revealing answers. All right. Can you hear a minute? Um, all right, go ahead. What we uncover may shock you and change your view of this famous murder case forever. Derry, New Hampshire, May 1st, 1990. 24 year old Greg Smart, an insurance salesman, is shot to death as he enters his condominium. Arrested for the crime is 16 year old Winnicunnet High School student Billy Flynn and three accomplices. Police learn that Flynn has been having an affair with Greg Smart's wife, 22 year old Pamela Smart, a media coordinator at the school. Pam is also arrested. And after a two-week televised trial, she is found guilty of multiple crimes, including accomplice to first-degree murder. Pamela Smart is sentenced to life in prison without parole. Billy and his accomplices are given lighter sentences after they cop a plea deal to cooperate with investigators. The media frenzy over the Pamela Smart case was unprecedented, and the story inspired numerous books and movies, including the 1995 Hollywood blockbuster To Die For, starring Nicole Kidman. By 2015, Billy Flynn, Pete Randall, J.R. Latimy, and Raymond Fowler are all released from prison. Meanwhile, Pamela Smart remains confined for life in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in Westchester County, New York, which is where we find her. What you're about to hear is Pamela Smart's own story. Thank you very much for doing this interview. Welcome. You've been incarcerated for 25 years. Almost 26. Yeah. Almost 26. Do you think of yourself as having been rehabilitated from that 22-year-old girl that you were? Um, well, I think that when, when I was younger, I really cared m mostly about, like most people do when they're young, whatever makes me happy at the moment. But that is, is totally not the kind of person I am now. I worry a lot about other people's feelings and more so than I than I did before. Do most of the people here know your story and know about you? They all do. They all do. Yeah. How does that affect your daily life here? Well, it's it's hard and it's frustrating at times because when people see you on TV or see a show, they think they know everything about your life or they think that every single thing that they read or see is true. And so there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of um, lies and there's a lot of sensationalism. So those things don't help me, they hurt me. 
But, I mean, I've been trying to straighten things out for 26 years, just like they keep saying I'm a teacher, and I've said it a thousand times, and I, I was never a teacher, and people still sometimes hold on to beliefs that they have because they don't want to be wrong. Although she insists she never conspired to murder her husband, she does concede to being guilty of bad judgment 26 years ago when she met and started a sexual relationship with then 15-year-old student Billy Flynn, a decision that would change both of their lives forever. When did you start realizing that you had gotten in too deep? After the relationship went to a physical level. And let's be clear, was this did you have real feelings for him? I did, I did. I know people would like to think that I didn't, but I did. And believe me, if I didn't, I would be happy to say that I didn't, <laughs> but I did. So why him? He was somebody who was thoughtful and he was somebody who was um, very kind and I was attracted to that or drawn to that. Were you in love with him? I thought I was back in my 22 year old mind, I did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously, he was 15. He was 16. You were 16? Oh. Yeah. So. Well, when it started. He might have been 15 when it started, but yeah, he was 16. I mean, it was, he, just, he was just turning 16, right. but nonetheless, whatever. So, so if, when you look back on that, are you, are you ashamed of that? Definitely, or? totally. Um, yes. Do you think he was in love with you? Um. Probably. It, it felt like love. Whatever that feels like, you know, back when you're 22, it, it felt like that. I always thought that there's probably nothing more powerful to a 15 or 16 year old boy than sex. And you, you know, that was a very powerful thing she was doing, whether she was aware of it or not. Um, he, I can't imagine he could think straight. <laughs> with what was going on with that. I think Bill was clearly a very sensitive, somewhat emotional kid who really thought he was in love with Pam Smart and really thought he had to save Pam Smart. But according to Pamela, Billy Flynn took his love to a disturbing level of obsession. According to your testimony, he tried to blackmail you and he yes, said, he did. you know, I'm going to I'm going to tell your husband. Yes. There were a few times where we, I did break up with him, but I was like I can't do this anymore. And he would say, like, like if a few days went by and I didn't relent, he would start saying, well, I'm gonna call um, Greg and I'm gonna tell Greg. And I obviously didn't want him to do that. I was afraid Greg would leave me, you know? So um, I would end up going back and it was kind of like this weird cyclical thing. You said that you didn't want your husband to leave you, you know, if, if if he blackmailed you. Now, your husband had an affair as well and had yes. told you about it. Yes, he did. I was totally devastated. I did not expect that. Um, I really loved him and I thought, you know, I was gonna spend the rest of my life with him and then he went and committed this indiscretion. Even at this point when you were having an affair with Billy, were you thinking that you could still save your marriage and stay married for the rest of your life? Or did you think the marriage was over? No, I was still thinking I could stay married, yeah. It was kind of like, hey, this is just a little problem and, you know, it's not going to be something. That, who thinks that something is going to turn so catastrophic? Nobody. It was basically just because I had an affair with Billy didn't mean I asked him to kill my husband. And I think that was sort of the bottom line with her. According to the kids that I talked to, um, not just one, but several kids, they're all saying that she you know, plotted this whole thing out. How to commit the murder, what weapon to use, what to wear. When you take away the little teardrops from Billy Flynn and the references that they're kids on the stand, uh, frankly, that case is like any other case. And as far as we were concerned, they were individuals trying to save their own butts, testifying like, uh, you know, trained animals at a circus in order to get what they needed in order to save themselves. So did Billy Flynn and his co-conspirators pin the blame on Pamela for something they did on their own? I was not guilty. I am not guilty. And at the time, I believed in the justice system. I was very naive. I thought that you don't go to jail if you're not guilty. And I was trusting in that. I had no idea really what I was up against, how bad it was going to be. So what really happened that night, May 1st, 1990? I worked all day. 
And then I had a meeting that I went to at night, which was, I believe, a school board meeting. And one of the items they were discussing was the media center. So I was there for that. And I can't remember exactly what time it ended, but I think probably like nine-ish or whatever. While Pamela was at the meeting, Billy Flynn and three close friends, Pete Randall, Vance Latimer Jr., and Raymond Fowler, drive more than 35 miles from their hometown of Seabrook to Pamela and Greg's condo in Derry, New Hampshire. There, Billy and Pete ambush Greg Smart as he arrives home from work. Billy kills Greg with a single gunshot to the head. When I got home, the door was open. It was, it was not, um, it was closed, but it was not locked. So I didn't think too much of it because I just went, you know, he was just supposed to be there. So when I went in and I pushed the door open, I just saw him laying there. But I didn't know that he was dead, but I called his name. He didn't respond. And like just real fast in like a second of looking up and looking around, it was obvious that somebody had broken into the, the condo. There was stuff all over the place. He was there. There was a candlestick next to his head. So I thought he had got hit or something. So I went to the, the neighbors and told them to come help. Something was wrong with him because I wasn't sure if somebody was still in the house. arrive at the scene, as does Greg Smart's brother, Dean. And there was Pam. And I remember her sitting by the far window, and she just kept asking repeatedly, 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 where is Halen? Halen was their little shizu dog that they named after Van Halen. Where is Halen? Where is Halen? Give me Halen. Give me Halen. And I just kept remembering, thinking to myself, how can you sit there and ask about the stupid Dog. Do you replay that night in your head a lot? Um, I, I didn't, actually, until I saw one of the movies about uh, this case. And I think it was the first one that was a made-for-TV movie where they had a reenactment. That, f for some reason, even though I know it's a reenactment, was like the worst thing that I could have ever seen. So it's like when I think about that, it's just I can't even imagine what he must have been thinking and feeling inside that house, and that really makes me sad. What made this case so fascinating was that uh, Pam Smart initially uh, sought media attention and played the role of the grieving spouse whose husband was killed. Uh, the initial press report suggested maybe this was a drug deal gone bad, and she was very defensive of her husband. You gave an interview um, to the local TV station pretty soon afterwards. Um, what was, why did you do that? What were you thinking? Well, it was just that, um, they, at the time, they were, the, the reporter was like relentless. Um, he was the one who ended up playing himself in the movie, um, about me, but he kept calling my mom and, and myself and saying that they had heard rumors that Greg was a drug dealer and that he was killed over drugs and, and all this big mess that he owed people money and so stuff that just wasn't even true and that they were going to go put that on the news if I didn't go on and say something to the contrary. But reporter Bill Spencer, who did indeed play himself in the television movie, has a very different version of how the interview was set up. Somebody says, hey, Bill, you got a phone call. It's Pamela Smart. And I was like, get out of here. You know, I'm not going to fall for that one. It was her. So in the first seconds of my conversation with Pam, she just told me, she said, um, you know, I, I really like the way you have been covering the story. You know, you, you've, you've talked a lot about Greg and his life, and, and you haven't focused on, on this negative crap about um, this being some kind of a drug deal. You know, th this was not a drug deal. This was, this was a, a burglary. I just respect the, f the way that you have covered this so far. I'd like to, you know, eventually talk to you about this. And Bill broke a lot of the early stories. I mean, he was the first one to talk to her. You know, he was the first one knocking on her door when the kids were arrested. He was very dogged in his uh, follow-up on this story, and he worked really hard to get everything he could out of it. At the beginning of that interview, everything seemed, you know, fine. And then she just said a few things that were 
way off, that were completely off the charts. Strange. It is this interview that raises suspicion. When I feel like if this happened at any point in Greg's life, it wouldn't be fair then. It wouldn't make sense then. It's just an awful tragedy. And now, you know, there's no better time in his life for this to happen. So we finish the interview, and then we have to shoot B-roll. She says to me, well, you know, I've got the top layer of our wedding cake in the freezer. What if I were to get that out? I could show it to you. Wouldn't that be kind of a um, poignant moment in your story? Instead of thinking like a widow, she's thinking like a producer of this story. And that's pretty bizarre. What was that about? I don't even remember, really, um, except for it was basically I read somewhere where he said that I was the one saying to do this and do that, and I don't. I was in such a state of mind at that point. I was not directing any TV production at that point. It was there was so much going on. I was 22 years old. My husband was murdered. Um, I had to pick out funeral uh, caskets and funeral arrangements and stuff I knew absolutely nothing about. It was just chaos. Everyone, all the friends, the family, everyone being around and everyone crying, all of us upset and lack, and lack of sleep and what have you. So the last thing I was doing was anything he said I was doing. I, I don't even know where he got that from. So this wasn't a situation where you thought, I can be on TV? Absolutely not. I mean, this wasn't something you would want to be on TV for. This is a tragedy. But Pamela did, in fact, do three interviews with Bill Spencer and one with journalist Tammy Plyler. Her behavior was drawing the attention of the public and of the police. There's a lot of things that happened at the same time. I mean, the, I mean, the big break was the gun. The gun uh, was reported to have been taken from Vance Latimer's father, I believe, and Vance Latimer's father turned the gun in. So obviously, that started pointing towards the boys. Uh, the, you know, Billy Flynn started pointing to Pam Smart. All we knew that night was that it was three teenage boys who went to Winnicunnet High School. And we knew that Pam was working at Winnicott kind of high school, and isn't that unusual? And I think things really start, people really start to raise an eyebrow and say, well, you know, she probably did it, right? The guys were arrested before you were arrested. Um, and so did you think that they were responsible for this murder right away? N not, in, not the initial t um, minute I found out they were arrested. It wasn't until the ballistics came back. I found myself at his initial arrest in my head def defending him, thinking that there's no way he could possibly have anything to do with this. There's no way he could hurt somebody. I just saw him as totally different, gentle, and not someone who would murder someone. So when you realize that the ballistics match and the guy who you've been sleeping with right. Is responsible. I felt horrible. I felt totally guilty for having been involved in the relationship with him. I felt like it was my fault Greg was dead, even though I know I didn't ask him to kill Greg or want him to kill Greg. I felt completely responsible and I felt afraid and alone. I was scared, not scared that I'm gonna be arrested, but scared that that this really happened and that it's not just a tragedy of him dying anymore. Now it looks like it's because of some choice I made. It would take six more weeks, but police eventually arrest Pamela Smart. I, I knew I was arrested for something to do with the case, but this is like a formality or whatever they're doing. This is stupid. I'm, I'm in a mind frame of a person who's not guilty, so I'm not thinking I'm gonna be tried, convicted, sentenced to life in prison. Mm -hmm. I wasn't afraid because I knew I hadn't done anything. I remember it was August 1st, and my birthday is August 16th, and I remember literally thinking, and I remember them telling me, be, oh, you'll be home for your birthday. What Pamela doesn't know is that she has been secretly recorded by someone she considers a friend. Cecilia Pierce. Yes. Uh, she was wired when she was talking mm -hmm. to you. You said something that sounded like, if you tell the truth, we're all going to jail. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Okay, Cecilia Pierce was the only one at the time that everything happened that had any kind of information about the case, anything about what happened in the house. Now, I desperately wanted to know, obviously, because 
I was involved with Bill Flynn and I wanted to know, did he really kill Greg and how did this happen? I wanted to know what happened in the house. And she was acting frantic, but what she was always doing was giving me some kind of information that I didn't find out from the police, but that I found out from her from finding out from the guys. It was clear nobody would be saying things like that if they weren't involved. And she was basically trying to convince Cecilia Pierce not to go to the police, to keep quiet, and saying if everybody else kept, keeps quiet, we'll be fine. So this was just another strong piece of evidence with all the other evidence in the case that pretty much put the nails in the coffin. So when you look at the things that she was saying, do you feel betrayed by her? Um, yeah, I mean, it's like she just, she actually admitted on the stand to going to look for a gun for Bill to kill Greg with before, before he was killed. She said she knew about the murder beforehand. She did nothing to stop it. She knew about it afterwards. She didn't do anything. And she was part of the planning, which is all everything I'm accused of. She got a deal which was never in writing, so that I could never say she got a deal. <laughs> but she just ne happened to never get arrested. If you could, so, if you could say I, something to her, what would you say? I would say, tell the truth. Stop lying. It's been long enough. And this is really crazy that I'm in prison for all these years, and she knows stuff that can help me get out. Supporters of Pamela Smart question the accuracy and reliability of these recordings. Obviously, I knew about it beforehand, and if I get their mind and they find out about it after, I'm going to get in trouble. Well, you know about it beforehand. You say you knew about it beforehand. Well, I did know about it beforehand. Yes, yeah, but you can say that you're going to get in trouble. They kind of cobbled together this very incriminating tape, which convicted her and which to this day convinces people that she was clearly involved. Not so sure there's controversy about how they were edited. They weren't really edited, they were enhanced. You know, they were pretty scratchy uh, recordings. So there are people whose specialty it is to enhance them. Pam's voice and Cecilia's were very similar. And very often they ascribed to Pam what Cecilia said and often they ascribed the opposite. The defense never moved to strike the tape saying the enhancement was an improper. We had transcripts made from the enhancement. They were given to the other side. They never moved to say that these transcripts were not consistent with where the tapes. Right, so this side, you're off the pain, right? So he's not going to say that you're off the pain. He's going to say you knew about it before it happened, which is the truth. Right, well, so then I'll have to say no, I didn't, and then you're going to believe me, or they're going to believe you. Yeah. Well, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. And it's not the same thing. You could rearrange that 50 different ways, but Pam says what, what she says on that, which is pretty much why for me are all going to jail. Any kind of police evidence is supposed to be taken to an expert first, it's authenticated, and then once it's authenticated, it's enhanced or whatever. When you literally listen to the tapes, you cannot hear anything. I mean, it, Greg's father threw off his headphones in the middle and said, I can't hear anything in the middle of trial. But it was used, and it was used to convict me. But TV interviews and incriminating tape recordings aren't the only evidence the prosecution mounts against Pamela Smart. There is, for example, the question of how the boys gain entry into the condo. One of the things that really stood out for people was the fact that the back door was unlocked that the boys had said she said she'd leave the back door unlocked. And what are the odds that their back door happened to be unlocked um, if they normally locked it on the day that these kids come by and decide to burglarize the house? The front door was unlocked half the time. I lived in a place that was no crime. It was just, that's how we lived. Basically, you're saying that the back door was unlocked just because that's I, I, how you live. I don't, yeah, but they didn't, they didn't come through the back door. I think the back door actually that night was locked. Okay, the back door was locked and the front door was... No, the front door was locked. I think the, they said the, they came through the bulkhead, through the, right. um, through the bottom, and that was unlocked. Okay. But I never, I don't think I ever in my life locked the bulkhead. I, I never really used it. Okay. Who, who goes in and out of their bulkhead? I mean, I go downstairs through the stairs. In order to commit this crime, the boys need a car. And on the day of the murder, Pamela helps them get one. 
you um, actually went to Massachusetts with the boys to pick up a car, correct? Right. What was that about? On numerous occasions, okay? One of which happened to be the same day. But um, they, they didn't have a car, and the one who had a driver's license, Vance Latimy, used to use his grandmother's car. So anywhere they needed to go, I was always driving people all over the place, not just them, because they had no, no car. Or I would drive him to his grandmother's house to pick up the car, which he would keep for the weekend sometimes. It was kind of like, hey, we don't have a car. Pam has a car. If we need to go get concert tickets, we need to go to the mall, we need to go here. Can you drive us here? And I was like, yeah, OK, drop you off, drive you here, whatever. So yeah, I drove them around a lot. Pamela Smart claims and we agree with her that she had nothing to do with the murder. Pamela Smart's defense attorney, Mark Sisti, believes that Billy Flynn and the other boys corroborated their story in order to implicate Pamela in a crime that they alone committed. She said, why don't we just use a gun and told me that if I was to stab him, it'd, probably, it'd get blood everywhere. She had asked, you know, whether to, she should scream, run house to house, or just run in and call the police. You know, how should she react? She told Bill not to kill Greg in front of the dog because it would traumatize the dog. We found it unusual that during the entire process that the young men were moving through the system together, much like a pack of jackals, right through the uh, district court system, the certification system, to the point of being housed together at the Rockingham County Jail, which is extremely unusual. Well, they were incarcerated at the same prison, that's true. Uh, and in fact, Mark Sisti, I thought he had a great opening line in his cross-examination. I think it was of Billy Flint. Who was the first person you saw this morning and who was the last person you uh, saw before you went to sleep last night? And I think it was Patrick Randall because they were cellmates. And like I said, like a pack of jackals, they were in the same den. And every night in the same den, they would communicate with each other. Got to remember, though, we had their statements to the police and the proffers long before they were sharing cells. Their statements. To the police, I mean, they varied. They were sketchy. They, they, were, not, they were not detailed in any way, shape, or form. Uh, these developed into stories that somehow ran on the same tracks, parallel and perfectly, by the time the trial began. Uh, they were as if it was a well-rehearsed lie. If you believe Billy Flynn was telling the truth, then you're done. You don't need any more evidence. And based on the way he testified, he would have to be an actor not to be telling the truth. After you pointed the gun at his head, what'd you do? I said, um, God forgive me. After you said, God forgive me, what happened? I pulled the trigger. He was crying the whole time, and he seemed like he was genuinely remorseful. It, it was, it was pretty heart-rending testimony. I think it was, it really affected probably everybody who was in that courtroom. Billy's testimony was very believable to the jury most of them anyway. There was one particular juror who kept a daily diary of the trial on tape, and it's evident that for much of the trial anyway, she had her doubts about Pamela's guilt and the competency of the defense, saying, quote, I can't speak for everybody on the jury, but I can certainly speak for me. They just didn't give her a defense. She didn't believe anybody on the stand. She didn't believe any of them. And she says, literally on tape, that if she knew that I was gonna get life in prison, she would have hung the jury. And she was hanging the jury all the way till the end, and then they changed her mind. If there was any doubt that Pamela was receiving a fair shake in the courtroom, it was nothing compared to the trial she was about to get in the media. Reporters are anxious to characterize Pamela early on, so her defense team goes to great lengths to shelter her. But in the face of a hungry news media, will that strategy backfire? She was instructed by her attorneys not to show emotion, not to testify from her seat, as O.J. Simpson did. And so there she was, frozen in this position. And of course, people projected onto that that she was a nice princess. I kept saying, um, why, why won't you defend me in the media or, you know, don't you think you sh you, not me, but don't you think you guys should be going on TV saying this or saying that? Look what they're saying. They're saying all these things that are not true. And they kept saying, I'll never forget, it was like a refrain. They kept saying um, that the case was going to be tried in the courtroom. It's going to be tried in the, a court of law, not in a court of public opinion. Mm -hmm. And I don't know 
where they were, but this case was tried in a court of public opinion before it was tried in a court of law. But I don't really fault them because I don't think they had any idea how huge it was gonna become either. And nobody was prepared for how big this got. There is no doubt that that case spawned an entire genre of, of reality TV, of, of court cases being covered completely. It was the first one, the first one of its kind, before OJ, uh, before any of these other high profile cases. This is the case that started all of it. If you were a reporter, how would you report the Pam Smart case? Now? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, before I would have reported it probably the same way everybody else did. Sex sells, sex lies, drugs, videotape, all that, it sells. So I probably would have done the same thing anybody else did. Now I would dig deeper, I would look at the people and try not to paint everybody with just this, this brush that defines them in one word. And, and people are way more complex than that. I think it was her youth. I think it was the youth of the co-defendants. I think it was the media blitz. I thought it was very glitzy. I thought that everything was just a perfect little case that could get the public aroused, if, if I will. And, uh, and it was played out by the media every day as something well beyond what it should have been. And that is a serious matter in a criminal courtroom. It turned into a circus. Alan Smart's expression as she came to court today was the same as always, a mask revealing nothing. There was a whole bunch of facts mixing with fiction and reality mixing with TV in this case, and people thinking they saw something or heard something that they actually got from the news. With no smoking gun, people took all these little pieces and put them together and, and saw a narrative that said, she's guilty. How say you, is the defendant guilty or not guilty of the offense charge? Guilty. <laughs> She was such a young woman when all of this started and is set to spend the rest of her life in that jail cell and die in that jail cell. You know, you have to ask yourself, for someone who didn't pull the trigger, should she be in prison for longer than the boys? Yes, they were young, but did they know wrong from right? They probably knew you don't shoot people. Um, so I think, there's a, I think the question is whether she should have got the sentence she got. I am required and do hereby sentence you to the New Hampshire State Prison for Women for the remainder of your life without the possibility of parole. It is fair. I have no problem with cooperating co-conspirators uh, getting a break. And it's not just their cooperation. They were young teenage kids who were taken advantage of. They were not Pam's victims. She was their victims. They put her in this prison. They got themselves out on her life. The finality of the sentence did nothing to quench the media's desire to tell and retell the Pamela Smart story. The mostly fictional novel, To Die For, was published less than a year after the trial. Less than a year after that came the television movie Murder in New Hampshire, starring Helen Hunt. And in 1995, To Die For was made into a Hollywood film starring Nicole Kidman. Let's talk about the movie, Nicole Kidman's movie, um, mm -hmm. to, to Die For. When did you see that for the first time? Here, as a blockbuster. It came as a blockbuster. What was that like, watching it? Terrible. I was embarrassed. She was, uh, first of all, she played me as like a complete airhead who doesn't care about anything and real dizzy and no brain whatsoever type of thing. And it was embarrassing. Do you think that people can confuse Nicole Kidman with you? I don't think, I know they do. It's our memories, that's how our minds work. So yes, there are plenty of things that happen in the movie that people confuse and they'll, or they'll say, oh yeah, that, that's true because I saw it in the movie. And I'll say, well, like everything you see on TV is not always true. And then they'll say, well, if it wasn't, if, if it wasn't true, it wouldn't be on there. And it's like, this is what I'm up against, you know? Actually, I get killed at the end of the movie, and they ice skate over my dead body. So you, we all know I'm alive, right? Okay, so we know everything in the movie is not true, but people are able to suspend disbelief for that part, but then take everything else as reality. Right. If you could talk to Nicole Kidman about her performance of you, what would you say to her? I would, I would say to Nicole Kidman that she's an acclaimed actress, and I, I believe she's a good person. She has a family, she has children, and that 
as a mother, she should take a look at the character that she's playing and, and come. she never came to see me. She never spoke to me. She never tried to find out anything to the contrary of you know the script that they gave her and that she played a one-dimensional character. And I'm not this person that they made me out to be. And my life is just frozen in this one moment of time and my worst mistake. And it's like, that's just what defines me forever. And I'm so much more complex. I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, no better than anybody else, but I'm so not a cold hearted person. I'm not a person that doesn't care about anybody but myself, my life prior to this experience and inside here for all these years has shown who I really am. What would a true movie about Pam Smart's life look like? Probably a lot more boring than people <laughs> would like to know, um, but it, it would just, it would be about an average person, an average girl who went to school, went to college and had hopes and dreams of a nice life and who made a horrible decision and got herself involved in something way over her head and those you know the catastrophic consequences of that but i think it would also be a story about redemption and about hope and about not dying inside despite tragic circumstances because i could just give up any day in here and i don't so i think there's an inspiring part to it too by 2015 Billy Flynn and his co-conspirators in the murder of Greg Smart have been released. Pamela Smart remains in prison without the possibility of parole. Does she have hope that she'll ever be free? What is your next step in life in general to get yourself out of here? Pray, because I think I need a miracle. What I'm gonna do is continue to work on developing stuff that I could bring back into court in a motion for proportionality review and to try to wait till another governor comes in in New Hampshire who's not running for a political office. It's obscene that Pam Smart is in jail to this day and has no possibility of getting out. Absolutely unthinkable. And as far as I'm concerned, this was the greatest miscarriage of justice in American jurisprudence. She has to look herself in the mirror every day with the prison over there. She knows what she did. She knows exactly what she did. So what is the best argument for parole for you? Well, the best argument is that I'm not guilty of the crime that I'm in prison for. And I don't know if I'd ever be able to convince everybody of that. But whether a person thinks I'm innocent or guilty, I've often heard from people that say they're not sure, but they all agree that this sentence is inhumane. Not quite. Prosecutor Paul Maggiato believes that Pamela's own decisions led to her harsh sentence. If Pam Smart would have admitted her guilt a long time ago, maybe she would have gotten a second degree murder uh, plea. Being a celebrity prisoner has come with added challenges. When she first came to Bedford in 93, um, she was probably not only the most hated woman in the prison, but probably the most hated woman in the world. How do you protect yourself, especially being high profile? Well, sometimes I haven't. <laughs> um, I was assaulted by two other inmates, and I was severely injured. I had a blowout fracture to my left orbit in my face, and um, a cyst on my knee, and I had to have surgery on my face where my face was cut open and a plastic plate was put in it. So I have no feeling in the left side of my face forever. And I am, have to take medication every day now because it's very painful still. And in 2003, a prison guard raped Pamela, threatened to kill her family if she didn't pose for photos, and then sold those photos to the National Enquirer tabloid. Pamela sued the state of New York and received a settlement. Her time in the prison has not been kind to her. She's been assaulted to the point that her face has been broken up and operated on. She's been sexually assaulted by the correctional uh, officers that were there to protect her. Uh, the people of the state of New Hampshire have taken one of their own and they've thrown her into a jungle. And uh, she, she knows where she is. While there's no denying that prison life has been rough for Pamela, not everything about confinement has been unpleasant. Do you get a lot of letters still? I get a lot of letters still. <laughs> Do you write them back? 
I write everybody back. Okay. <laughs> At least once. <laughs> well, I feel I feel um, grateful that they even stopped their day and took the time to write me and to be supportive of me. So I feel like, who, what do I look like not even answering or responding? So can you describe for me what a typical day is like here? Um, yeah, we, we, I get up at about 5.30 or 6 o'clock, and I work in the mornings and the afternoons um, as a a program aid for the ACE program, which is AIDS Counseling and Education Program. Mm -hmm. And then in the afternoons, like after 3, 40, 4 o'clock, we have free. And then at night, I'm going somewhere every night. <laughs> One of my activities, either RTA, which I have twice a week, or praise dance once a week, Bible study once a week, services the other night. So. It's my sky. I'm a very busy person. Tell me a little bit about rehabilitation through the arts. Um, yes. You went to a playwriting seminar. You've done a few different things. Mm, a you, lot, can yes. Can you tell me some about um, that? I've been with the program for uh, seven years since its inception. And it's a program where they use all different forms of arts, like literature and dance, theater, movement, um, all kinds of arts to help us look at ourselves and look at other people and work on ourselves and work on changing the world around us inside here and hopefully outside when, when we leave. I never forgot you. I was too stubborn and hurt to let you know. I couldn't forgive, I couldn't bend. I didn't care then about anyone but me. Whether you believe that Pamela Smart has been falsely convicted, unfairly sentenced, or whether you believe she's guilty and exactly where she belongs, one thing is certain, Pamela herself continues to insist that she's innocent. Pam Smart will never say that she participated in this murder because she didn't. Even if she has to spend the rest of her life in prison, which is possible that she will. Who, in their right mind, would rather spend the rest of their lives in prison uh, for reasons of stubbornness or pride or ego or image. Nobody, no sane person would. And Pam is very sane. I'm not gonna sit here and say, I didn't know any better. I, you know, was this or I was that. I knew better and I did it anyways. And for that, I've lost 26 years of my life and God knows how much more. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I paid the price for that. I mean, I t constantly punish myself for that in my own head. You know, I feel like even though I didn't tell them to kill Greg, or even though I didn't give them the gun, I feel like I put the bullets in there sometime by having this relationship. Mm -hmm. And so does that make me responsible for his death in my mind? Yeah, a lot. You know, is it, am I legally culpable? No, but um, do I blame myself? I do all the time. And that's, that's really hard to live with. Mm -hmm. right. A person, a beautiful person is gone. And then uh, sometimes I say, because of me. Mm -hmm.